Hi, this is Andrew Laram for ConsciousLifeNews.com and I am very honored to be here today with Dr. Judith Orloff who is um, an assistant professor of psychiatry at UCLA and the author of her new book, The Ecstasy of Surrender. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing this time and space with me. Um, I want you to just start off with a little bit about your background and how you came to doing this book and what led you to be, uh, writing this book. Well, I'm a psychiatrist, I'm an MD, and I've had 14 years of medical training. I went to a USC Medical School and I did my residency at UCLA. Um, incredible traditional medical training. Mm -hmm. um, plus, I'm also an intuitive, so I combine my traditional medical training with tuning into people with my intuition and getting intuitive insights uh, about them to help them in therapy. Basically. And when you were doing this early on, were you open about using your intuition in your work or was it something that you kind of did a little bit more personally without sharing? Well, in Second Sight, that's my very first book, I talk about my own journey and I was a psychic child. I would have premonitions and I would have um, flashes about things that came true and my parents who are both doctors and I come from a lineage of 25 doctors in my family <laughs> yeah a lot they told me never mention another one of your intuitions at home again oh, wow. so I grew up believing there was something wrong with me so I did not surrender to my intuition I in fact walled it off and became ashamed of it but my healing path has been listening to my inner voices that have been directing me in my career. I had a dream in my early 20s to become a psychiatrist, to have the credentials to legitimize intuition in medicine. And it was at a point when I had no desire whatsoever to go into medicine. I was more of an artist and working in the towel department in the May Company and I living with my boyfriend in Venice Beach and I did not want to go through all those mm -hmm. years of medical school. But I had a very clear dream that I did surrender to. And then I went through 14 years of medical training because it was my destiny. And so that's, and in the process, I've come to accept my intuitive voice and be very proud of it and I'm not afraid of it. So I incorporate it as a physician and give workshops and teach my patients mm -hmm. and workshop participants how to tap in and surrender to their inner voice so they could be in touch with the flow of life that's so potent and vibrant rather than just being stuck in their heads all the time, which is very dry and it doesn't get you to the essence of life and where you need to go. And that's really interesting because I think um, when people start, well we always are in touch with our intuition, but start acknowledging it more so, yeah. it kind of feels like a rift of the daily lives we live and the interactions and so on we have and then like we have this intuition piece and they kind of like don't look like they make sense together. Right, right. But I think one of the um, most important things in like living your life path and doing it in balance is actually incorporating the two. Yes. So even though yes. they look like they don't go together at all, they actually do in essence. Oh, they're beautiful partners. I don't know how I would live without my intuition and just live in my head. It's a horrible thought. Yeah. <laughs> No, it's painful because what goes on up there all the time. Yeah. <laughs> but intuition is your still small voice inside. And the surrender to intuition, the ecstasy of surrendering to intuition, is trusting your inner guidance. I mean, there is bliss and ecstasy that comes from surrendering to that when you can. Mm -hmm. You see, but you've got to surrender any negative thoughts that tell you not to do it. You know, you have to surrender society's words that, oh, what are you doing trusting your intuition or making a decision on a dream? How crazy is that? And you've got to let go of those voices and trust your dreams, trust your intuitions, mm -hmm. and just go for it. Let go. Surrender to it and have fun with it. Excellent. Now that takes me on to the title of your new book, The Ecstasy of Surrender, and it's quite specific. So could you talk a little bit about ecstasy and what it means to you in surrender? Ecstasy is the opening of the heart, mm -hmm. and it comes from the heart energy, and there's a pulse when you open your heart energetically. It's like a, the Taoists call it the warm sun, the little mm -hmm. sun, and you start through regular meditation practice, you start feeling the pulse of that warmth in your heart, and it spreads throughout your body, and when you're in the moment, when you're surrendered to the moment, and your heart, that pulse of ecstasy can happen the minute you wake up, the minute you walk down the street, and the minute you start focusing, if you know how to get there. And people don't experience a lot of ecstasy, and particularly in the Western world, and I want them to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, want, I want the 
good to see it's not an alien concept that you can in this moment when we're together I'm experiencing the bliss and the ecstasy because we're both connecting with our mm -hmm. hearts and we're here totally in the moment that's the surrender it's not the mind going well what am I going to do next or the to-do yeah. list that never gets done surrendering the to-do list surrendering anything else but this and then you begin to vibe and connect and go deeply surrendering to the ecstasy of an interaction um, it allows you to feel more bliss and even if you're going through something very difficult um, mm -hmm. such as illness or relationship breakups or loss if you don't fight it and you don't clench and become smaller then the passage through that time is so much easier mm, that totally makes sense yeah. now you know I believe like we have four main areas which is um, the physical, the emotional, the mental, and the spiritual. And so could you talk about surrender in, in a relation to those different areas, different types of surrender? Yes, there are different types of surrender. And physical surrender, the first one is surrender to being human, that mm -hmm. we have these human bodies that house our spirits, and there are temples, and not to self-loathe and not to hate them, mm -hmm. but to really embrace them and listen to your body, take good care of your body all the time. That's number one. You know, don't just push and rush and don't eat well and don't exercise. Listen to what the body needs because that will nurture your spirit as well. And physical surrender such as stretching mm -hmm. or yoga or orgasm, you know, to be able to just experience the letting go into the stretching or the orgasm rather than holding back, you know, stretching but looking at the person's body next to you in the yoga class. <laughs> You know, I did that yesterday. Yeah, yeah. No, we all do. But you want it, the surrender is for saying, uh -huh, you know, being very kind to yourself. And bringing you yourself back. Bring it back, yeah. but enjoying that stretch. And particularly if you've traveled, when I travel a lot, I, my joints tend to contract. So the stretching, you know, it's letting mm. go of all that travel stress and the physical surrender of that, and also the physical surrender of aging. You know, the whole process of aging in a radiant way where you surrender into the bliss rather than holding on to resentments and, you know, all kinds of betrayals or losses or the whole, you know, path of carnage that has happened to everybody. You know, to be able to say namaste, let go of it, and then face your future in the moment. Mm. You know, because then when you age, you're not burdened by all these resentments. Every resentment weighs something. And... It weighs on your shoulders, it weighs in your face, it weighs in your heart. And so you don't want to hold on to them, you know, less so for the other person, but more so for you. So, you know, with aging, the physical surrender is the lightness of being, where you mm -hmm. surrender into your energies. And spiritual surrender, rather than just getting burdened, like that that's the, the horrible prototype of aging. People have been burdened and haven't been yeah. let go of anything or known about surrender, then they look very burdened and, and downcast and heavy. But you want to get more radiant as you mm -hmm. age through the process of surrendering anything that doesn't serve you or fears or negative patterns and make that your meditation. On a daily basis, a joyous meditation, not, oh my God, I you know, make it into work, but just little by little lightening the load mm -hmm. as you age. And then the aging process is very different when you do that. So also they, um, you mentioned in your book about the stages of letting go. Yeah. So that's very, I would like to cover that because I feel like sometimes, you know, we psych ourselves up and we're like, I surrender it, I let it go. Right. <laughs> and then it's just like this, this ego mind trick and then like right. you take two steps and there it is on your shoulder there it is back right. again. So could you yeah. talk about the stages of letting go? Yes, well, there's often resistance you might know that you need to let go of your pattern of being attracted to unavailable people, mm -hmm. you know, which I talk about in the book, and we were discussing it's a big before. one, yeah, <laughs> it's a big one. A big one, you might know that, but then you have resistance because mm -hmm. this guy in front of you is so incredible. Even though there's signs he's unavailable, no, it will be different, I have resistance, but yet your intuition tells you, nope, just the same, not available. So you resist, but then if you can accept, you know, all right, you know, this is my pattern, this is what this person is, and just accept it, and then you can let the pattern go. So it's resistance, acceptance, and then release. Okay. So it's often a process, and people think, oh, I've done my surrender work, and that makes me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, it doesn't work that way. It keep, it's an ongoing process of being. It's surrendering in the moment. Sometimes I surrender to things I had no idea I was going to surrender to. 
when I was writing this book, I, I surrendered so much. I surrendered the place where I lived. I became nomadic for about a year and moved ten times. Mm. You no, know, which is moving creates a lot of surrender. You know, and just uh, I surrendered all my possessions. I gave up everything wow. just by choice. Mm -hmm. I wanted to. It was enlightening. Yeah. You know, I, I felt like intuitively that was good. So those things have allowed me to become lighter and happier and freer and more daring. You no, know, and um, it just has felt really good. But sometimes people have fear of surrender because if they give up all this, what will they have? What security will mm -hmm. they have? What grounding to this reality will they have? And the grounding is yourself. You know, and your heart and the love, and that that's the surrender practice is meditating, coming back to yourself and the connection with the self, because we come here to this planet alone, we make transition you know, through our mother's body, and then we leave here alone, and mm -hmm. we have the final surrender, the passage into death. Um, and so you want to really develop yourself while you're here, and your soul, because that's what you take with you. You don't take any of this. Like, I don't take you, you don't... You don't take anything with you but this. Exactly. So this is what you want to develop to make sure it's really good, and then you take that with you. And that, that's important. Mm. And now, speaking of that, like, how would you advise people to practice discernment in their surrendering? Because we could be thinking we are surrendering to, um, well, this is just the way it's meant to be, or it could be our own crap in life that has created that, and then now we're saying we're surrendering to divine plan, but really we're just giving in to our patterns and so on. So could you talk a little bit about having discernment in surrendering? Yes, I mean, especially with fears. Mm. You need to list your top five fears so you don't mistake them for surrendering to something positive. Mm. For instance, if you have a fear of abandonment, does mm. that keep you out of relationships because you're afraid of getting involved and abandoned, which is a terrible fear. When you have that, it takes a lot of work to really mm. clear that. Um, do I have fear of success? Is that why I don't go for the jobs? And you might rationalize, oh, I, I, that job isn't right for me, but really the motivation is I'm afraid I won't get it. So if you notice your, your areas, top five areas, with self-compassion, you know, very kind to yourself yeah. with all this, not beat yourself up, oh my God, I'm 45 years old and I still have this thing with my mother. You know, yeah. It doesn't matter, time's irrelevant. I mean, as a psychiatrist, what I've seen and I have deep respect for when you're ready to face your issues, that's when mm. it comes up. And it might come up at age 20, it might come up at 95. I've worked with women in their 90s who wow. are finally ready to address their mother issues. Interesting. How great is that? <laughs> yeah. I think it's wonderful, but people have this arbitrary linear timeline. They're supposed to get married by this age, oh. and they're supposed to get rid of this issue by this age. And it just doesn't work that way, as I've seen as a psychiatrist. So that's why you have to surrender to when it's appropriate, when you feel attracted to work on something, or when life puts it in your face where you must work on it. That's the surrender. Interesting. And I find that um, for myself as well, and a lot of friends, that when we're talking about, you know, just as divine beings, what we want in our lives, and so on, and then we do these prayers and, you know, meditate on it, and so on. and then for some reason there's this really twisted idea that it's just going to pop up and everything's going to be perfect. You know, this is my perspective. So what I believe happens is everything that we have developed that blocks us from that because it's our natural inheritance right. is what right. comes up. Right. And I feel like at that point it's kind of like, a, oh, well, God doesn't want me to have this, I guess. And, you know, it's kind of like a turning away. But if we can see what comes up and yes. there are our own blockages, to, to living the life we want to live and living in ecstasy, you know? So could you just talk a little bit about the responsibility, self-responsibility of actually like doing some internal work? So it's not an idea of surrendering and putting our head in the sand. It's like surrendering to everything that really is and working through it and then letting it go. Yeah, that's a great question. Well, there's a chapter in the book on soulmates. Mm -hmm. and I read uh, that last night. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, and if you want a soulmate, I suggest that you read it. I mean, as a soulmate is somebody who is there to support your soul. Mm -hmm. They'll show up for you. They're there for you, and you're there for them. That's a soulmate. It's not an unavailable person. It's not just someone that you're in lust with, not in love with. You know, it's somebody who shows up for you. And so it, it's, it behooves you to be discerning about that. Mm -hmm. And just because you have this electric reaction to somebody, and you feel incredible attraction, your hearts are combining, 
Um, it might not be your soulmate. It's a very tricky thing that your biology does with you. And so you have to be aware of that. In addition to all that reaction, you need to see somebody's behavior in terms of how they are with you. And the discernment comes with really, you know, being able to look at people and seeing what they, what you give to each other mutually. And if you mm -hmm. can be partners, you know, as opposed to chasing after someone, as opposed to decoding someone, as opposed to, you know, being involved with a narcissistic relationship, which, you know, I talk about in the book, because narcissists are very, very charming. Mm. You know, they're very funny and charming and intelligent, but uh, and they reel you in, but then they lack empathy. Mm -hmm. And so they're not able to care about your feelings. And I, I've seen many of my patients get involved, surrender to the love and connection with a you know, charming narcissist. And it takes 20 years to get out of that relationship mm -hmm. because they're so intuitively smart where they know how to reel you back in after you, know, you want to leave. So be very careful and discerning what you surrender to and what you don't surrender to. In the book, I'm not saying surrender to everything that comes your way. I'm saying make a choice about what you surrender to or not and surrender to all the good things that could be good for you in your life and say no, don't surrender to the flow of fear or negative people or mm -hmm. narcissists or unavailable people if what you're searching for is a soulmate. As the soulmate, I always tell people don't go searching for love. Remove the barriers mm -hmm. to love. And some of those patterns are what you want to surrender just by being very honest with yourself and saying, all right, you know, I had an alcoholic father. He was never there for me. And I keep trying to repeat that with my relationships. And the idea is if I convert this person, this unavailable person, to an available person, I'll heal the pattern with my father. Yeah. That's and to complete the past. Yeah, with and, somebody and now. <laughs> I wish it worked that way, but it doesn't. <laughs> it won't heal the past. And you, the healing comes in different ways. And this is like with surrender and you know, so we know it comes from the heart center and intuition and so on, but you do highlight the use of in intuitive intelligence. So we're yes. not saying like throw the mind out, no, right? No. We're still going to no. use it as a tool Yes. and we're going to use it to, to observe and, and see what's going on and mix it in and, you know, use the discernment and use our intelligence as yes. well. Okay? Absolutely. So it's a balancing act. It's a balancing act. You use the mind for what it's good for. Analyzing, mm -hmm. judging things, making lists, you know, really being logical and scientific and debating. It's so good at so many things. Mm -hmm. But what it, it isn't good at is spiritual surrender mm -hmm. or love. The mind can't fall in love like the heart can. The spiritual surrender I'm talking about in the book is turning your life over to a higher power and really be, being able to surrender the results once you've done everything to make it happen. Where you don't just keep making it happen forever. That's not the whole process. It's making it happen and then letting go of the outcome. Mm. And that's the hard part for people. Yeah. If they let go, will it just fall apart? Now the answer is, it has a greater chance of working out if you let go. <laughs> I can't Let's guarantee. Yeah, I can't guarantee it's going to happen, but you have a greater chance yeah. because just by the laws of the universe, that that's how it works, and that's what's so hard for people. You make it happen. It's like the law of attraction. You want to set your attention, mm -hmm. but then you have to let it go, and people don't realize that. I worked in a parapsychology lab uh, many years ago. And we used to have spoon bending parties mm -hmm. where you bend metal with your mind. And the principle was, like, you hold a fork up, and you look at it, and you go, bend, 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 and you yell at it, and then you let go of any intention of it bending. And only with that can the fork bend. Interesting. And that applies to your life now and surrendering. It's doing everything you can to make it happen, but then letting it go, getting mm -hmm. your hands off of it and giving it to the universe. And this is not as commonly as it's thought. It's not a sign of weakness. It's actually empowering yourself. So could you talk a little bit about surrender as empowerment and kind of break the, right. the belief of it being something other than that? Right. Um, the old belief is surrender is weakness, it's mm. failure, it's the opposite of the Puritan ethic where you, you know, work, work, work to get your goals done and no surrender there. You know, mm -hmm. that's not... <laughs> it's hard work. <laughs> yeah, hard work gets you what you want. And what I'm doing with surrender is taking it to the next step. Hard work is incredible. You know, good, hard, passionate work is incredible. Mm -hmm. However, the missing piece to the Puritan ethic is letting it go. Like mm -hmm. doing everything possible 
and then letting it go and then watching for the results. You don't keep checking, well, did it happen? Did it happen? Did it happen? <laughs> <laughs> but that's what people because think. I did let go now it should be happening, be happening. Right? <laughs> yeah it should be happening but you, you have to try to let go of any attachment to mm. it happening and that creates magic mm. you know as you get better at that of course you can't perfect it and it takes practice but even moment by moment just let go of the attachment for a moment mm. you know and just be free give it to something beautiful Try and believe that there's something beautiful all around you, invisible hands that are just waiting to take your project, are waiting to take your deepest heart's desires, but you have to give it to them. Mm -hmm. They're not going to grab it away from you. You have to surrender it to them. Here, yeah. here, here, angels, take this. Now, the angels are real. Here, take it. You know, and then let it go. Let the bird fly. Because <laughs> you have to be willing to let go of it, you know, and this is... You do. Again, um, as well, you mentioned about the dance between destiny and will. Yeah, that's So could you discuss one. that a little bit? Because I think that is when do, you, when do you know when to let it go? When do you know when to put the work in and exert the power of your mind and your physical body and efforts? And when do you, you know, the dance of it... Yeah, so I think first and foremost, in terms of surrender, you have to realize there's a destiny going on in terms mm -hmm. of what you're destined to do here in this, this world. I mean, you may want to, you know, go out and run a, you know, a corporation, but perhaps you're destined to be a hospice worker. Yeah. And that's where everything is taking you. So that's the flow of surrender. In your head, you might have this idea, but really life is taking you in another direction. And if that's so, you really need to begin to trust that go where you're being called. That's surrender in life, mm. in terms of destiny. There's an inner calling, and life will show you. Now, if there's energy there, if you want a project done, if you have a goal, if there's energy there, it will move forward. But if you keep trying to push something and force something that just it doesn't have any energy to it, it won't happen. As much as you might want it to happen, or it won't happen at that moment, or perhaps you have to take another way around and another mm. door, but to keep going in the same direction when you're forcing things over and over again, that's a sign to back off and reevaluate, regroup. Okay. And also, I just wanted you to touch on um, being an empath, and especially in relationships, because, you know, I think one of the ones that popped to me was the, you know, going after unavailable people, which I think is a really predominant issue. Um, and then also, like, being an empath. When I read that chapter, like, I could totally relate to it. And just, you know, you mentioned possibly sleeping in separate bedrooms. I don't know if I would go that far, but, but there's other things about allowing each other space. Could you just describe a little bit about what an empath is and, and how to be able to keep that in your awareness as you're surrendering as well? Right. Well, I'm an empath, so I have, you know, particularly interest in this topic because mm -hmm. I've had to really work with it in myself. Because for me to be in a relationship with somebody, an intimate relationship, I have to set unusual limits and boundaries mm -hmm. with them. Yes, I need a lot of alone time. Mm -hmm. I don't empaths don't enjoy a lot of togetherness like other couples. <laughs> it's different. And it's not a sign you don't love the person, it's just that you need your alone time. Empaths replenished by being alone. Mm -hmm. Em relationship empaths, and this is in the relationship chapter. Um, ask if there's a quiz. Ask yourself some questions. Have you been labeled as overly sensitive? How do mm -hmm. you know you're an empath? Now, do you replenish alone versus in crowds? Do you like to take your own car places so that you can leave when you please and not get stuck somewhere? You know, are you sensitive to smells, sounds, and excessive mm -hmm. talking? You know, empaths often can't deal with sounds. You know, I'm very noise sensitive, extremely noise sensitive. Mm -hmm. So sound can just blow me away. And smells, empaths have a really intense sense of smell. Or have you a fear of relationships, a fear of getting engulfed? By mm. relationships. I think that's a big one. Yeah. Yeah. With people who may not categorize themselves as empaths, but they want relationships, but then it becomes so overwhelming. Yeah. And like the, the psyche hasn't kind of wrapped around the idea fully of, oh, okay, well, we can be together, but let's make a new system. Yeah, let's make it creative it. conversations. And you, know, you need to talk to your mate about your needs, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of your sensitivity, that you need to be alone, you need to have a space that you can go to to be alone, and they need to not hover around you. In mm -hmm. addition, because you can feel a hoverer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they have to 
go away. <laughs> Consciousness, energy, everything, away. And you have to explain to them, this is not because I don't love you. Mm. It's because I need to be alone. And I need my alone time. And so a soulmate will respect that. I was with one man once who got me a gift for my birthday, which was a keep out sign of my door. <laughs> yeah, <Mr. laughs> Did I put it on there when I wanted him to go elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. And now this applies not just with uh, romantic relationships. No. This is family, friends, if you have roommates, if you have children, right, right. to like honor that within yourself. If you realize you are an empath and that's how you you know, rejuvenate yourself, then you need to honor that and make that time and space for yourself. Yes, and honor your square footage needs, you mm -hmm. know, with a mate or with a, if you're in a family, you know, just to have, you know, a lot of empaths have separate wings or mm -hmm. separate homes or they live in separate apartments, you know, or whatever, and visit three times a week or four times a week. And what you said about sleeping together, sometimes it's nice for empaths to have their dream time alone. Mm -hmm. Because when you're sleeping with somebody, you're overlapping with their energy field. And sometimes empaths need to be alone when they sleep. And it depends on the level of stimulation, as empaths get very overstimulated. And so they, they might need to be alone at those times, you know, instead of being overstimulated. So empaths need a lot of self-care techniques that I talk about in the book. Mm -hmm. And when I do that, I'm fine. And the great side of being an empath, we're talking about the difficulties, <laughs> is it allows you to passionately tune in mm -hmm. and be involved with the mysteries of the universe and be able to feel a flower talking to you and, and incredible sensual awareness and connection to the universe and empathy and compassion. You know, as a psychiatrist, it helps me so much mm -hmm. to be able to feel what's going on in another person without taking it on. And in the book, I talk about empathic illnesses where mm -hmm. empaths can even take on the yeah. symptoms and huge illnesses from other people into their bodies because they're sponges. And how not to do that? That's not a good thing. Yeah, and there's two sides to every coin, and it's, it's like the positive of the empath, how you're saying, and it, it not only is beneficial to you, but like if you're in relationship with an empath, you're going to benefit from it because they're going to come back fresh and be able yeah, to give you that yeah. love and compassion and deep understanding that empaths are known for. Absolutely. You know, so it's, it's in everybody's interest to honor that space for empaths. Absolutely, and I just wanted to give people practical tools, what you can do if you're an empath, you're living with an empath, to mm. apply to make the situation better and livable and wonderful. But what you can do, you need tools for that. Yeah, and that's what I did love about the book because I kind of, when I picked her up, I first kind of like thought to myself, it's going to be about going with the flow and so on. <laughs> but I was very, very impressed because it's actually, you know, helping people work through their own stuff and see their own blockages and surrender. So there's a whole process. It's not a foo-foo, go with the wind, like let's just surrender to everything. It's actually very spiritual psychology based, right. you know, and, it, and it's interactive because you can do the quizzes and so on and learn a bit more about yourself and, and expand your consciousness in that way. Always, and be happy with baby steps of progress. It's mm. so good, little steps forward. Surrender can be difficult with certain things, like if you lose a loved one, mm. to surrender to grief, you know, which I'm suggesting. Yeah. You know, surrender to the grief and trust it, and there's often clenchings and holdings. But that's where intuition helps, because you can tune into your body and feel where you're clenching and holding, and be very loving and compassionate, mm. then breathe through it so you can relax, maybe do a yoga stretch so you can open up your channels in your body, you know, or just put your hands up in the air and stretch up to the heavens, do something to open it up when you feel clenched, but you can tune in to when you're not surrendering, mm. you know, when you're you holding. Feel it, yeah. yeah, and with love, the surrender techniques that I talk about allow you not to be guarded and mm. to be able to be unguarded, undefended with someone that you trust and love. You know, instead of giving this much, to really get, really surrender to that love completely. Mm. You know, not just a little. People give a little and then they go off and do their lives and they sort of interact, but this is like true connection. Excellent. So, going on from that, the practical applications of surrender on a daily basis. So, yeah. if you're not into doing the reading or the spiritual psychology stuff as much, there's like, this is for everybody. So, could you just talk a little bit about how people can incorporate surrendering throughout their daily lives? Well, right now, if you want to experience the ecstasy of surrender, just slow down and take a breath. Just... <sighs> a long 
but begin to feel the heart open as you take the breath and the inhalation and the exhalation. Slow it down and feel that and connect. And then, you know, if you're drinking water, you know, just have a glass of water very slowly, the sacred, beautiful water that the native traditions so revere. Drink the water slowly and just feel as it goes down into your body. You know, the liquid nurturing. You know, just mm. begin to get into mindful eating and mm. feeling the energy of food. You know, or slowing down and giving your partner a hug instead of rushing through everything. Just a, a long hug and, and vibe and enjoy. It means savoring. The ecstasy mm. means savoring instead of, mm, I did this and I'm done. I'm going to the Quick, quick, like sound bite society. Yeah. <laughs> no, but that stops you from enjoying. Yeah. You know, to slow it down in little things, and also I suggest as a surrender technique in the book, look up. Mm. You know, look up at the heavens. You know, look up at the sky and see the wonder of it all. We're here on this planet, but get a, yeah. get a perspective. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that will bring wonder and awe. You know, if you think we're here, but look it up there, and it's up there all the time. Mm. You know, like with the eclipse the other night, I just spent hours watching that you full lunar it. eclipse mm. and feeling the moon in my body. There's mm. a chapter in the book on the sensual um, essence of the natural world, mm. fire, water, air, and earth, and surrendering to those and watching what they, how they can teach us about surrender, such as the water doesn't keep going up against the boulder. The water flows around the boulder, mm. you know, the flexibility that we can all have instead of going up against an energy vampire like this in a flowing it's a different technique nature can teach you about surrender mm. and um, could you just talk a little bit about energy vampires because I do like that topic in the sense of not that I like energy vampires but <laughs> the topic in the sense of you know because we we want to practice being loving and being compassionate sometimes it can kind of like get messy in the sense you're just you you interacting with energy vampires and it's draining you instead of of being for the highest good of everybody concerned. So could you just how would you describe an energy vampire and what can we do around them? Well, in the book I talk about these difficult people who can sap your energy dry mm -hmm. and when you're around them your eyelids get heavy, you feel like taking a nap, you might start <laughs> feeling toxic or or not good, your your mood changes or you might get physical pain around them. So they're those energy suckers, basically, mm. that are around. And I go through different types in the book and strategies that you can use in your daily life to deal with them. And the main, a general strategy for all of it is do not react when they push your buttons. Mm. You know, because the good reason for that is that if you don't react, you're not giving them the energy that they want. Interesting. Yeah. And that's a practice. They feed on your energy mm. and your reaction, your reactivity. If you can just look at them, pause, take a breath, center yourself, and then try and deal with them in a very calm but firm way, but not giving them energy. You know, for instance, the, the victim, mm -hmm. somebody who talks to you on the phone after a long day's work and keeps you there going around with, my mother doesn't understand me, my boss just gave another person a promotion, my boyfriend left me for the 10th time. You know, oh, but you've heard the story 20 million mm -hmm. times before. And then when you offer solutions, they say, yes, but... God, yeah, I know those yeah. ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you don't want to surrender to them. The mm -hmm. mistake many of my patients make is they think if I'm a compassionate person, I'm going to keep listening. Yeah. But then they start, you know, screening the calls and they start running. They start fearful, you know, running from the person. But you don't want to do that. You want to learn how to set very clear limits and boundaries and say, mm -hmm. you know, you're my friend. I love you. But unless you want to get into solutions, I can only listen for two minutes. And how long did it take for me to say that? Very short. No. You don't get into it with an energy vampire. No long discussions or confrontations. Very short, good eye contact, loving tone, in and out, that's it. But you're not my friend. Why don't you listen to me if you hear that? You have to stay very centered and say, yes, I am your friend, but I'll talk to you if you want solutions, but otherwise, no. Excellent. Yeah. I think, yeah, we can all use some of that advice. That's, that's excellent because I feel like a lot of, there is that, you know, wanting to be compassionate and loving and to your friends and, and every, lift everybody's consciousness and vibration up, you know, but some right. people, it's not their time and space. It's not a judgmental thing. It's just not where other people are at, you know? No, so. and sometimes the best medicine for people is setting limits and boundaries. It's not just mm -hmm. codependently going along with it, whatever they're, they're wanting. So you don't surrender to the person and just listen to them endlessly because then you'll resent them and run from them. 
Um, you'll set limits and boundaries with them. It's very healthy. And something I say in the book is that no is a complete sentence. Mm. You don't have to I explain like it. You don't have to defend it. It's just, no, I'm sorry, I can't do that. No, I can't talk any longer. But the tone of voice is what's critical. Mm. If you're snippy, if you're judgmental or blaming, then it won't work. And that you can discern that by knowing whether you're centered when you're saying that yeah. no, or whether you're in reaction. Because I feel yeah. like when it comes from reaction, that's exactly. the charge. And in exactly. a sense, exactly. they if you know it's an energy vampire, they just got the energy, right? right? Because right. they're like, they're no, not going to do it. Da, 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 da. Right. But you've just literally given yeah, them all yeah, the yeah. energy. So yeah. it's, it's having the boundaries and in from a centered space. Right, exactly. Exactly. And not surrendering to them. Mm. You know, you don't. That's where you want to be discerning, as you said before, and not surrender to them. So apply the techniques in the book. You know, get ready. Have a plan. Say, okay, I'm dealing with a narcissist. I have a narcissistic boss. How am I going to deal with it? And then have your plan together. And then when the narcissist does something, then you can, you know, go enact a plan. But you can't just sort of think on your feet. You have to have a plan. That's why I wrote the book, so you have the strategies in daily life. And then you try it out. Yeah, I, I love the book, so I highly, highly recommend it to anybody um, who wants to surrender on any level. And you do also do workshops and so on. Um, would you mind just giving a little bit more information about other things you do and where people can buy the book and look you up on your website? So. Well, I give, into, I give workshops on the power of intuition and mm -hmm. how to surrender to intuition. And every year I give a workshop at Esalen. Institute in Big Sur, which is so beautiful. beautiful in the summer. And you can look up my workshop schedule on my website mm -hmm. and also find the book on my website or Amazon or any local bookstore. And the website is drjudithorloff.com. Okay, and we'll have all the information, <coughs> excuse me, on the site as well um, when we post the interview. Thank you so much, Judith. I really appreciate you sharing this time and space with me and discussing your new book and your work and your perspective. Thank oh, you. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you. This is Angela Ram for Conscious Life News. Thank you, and thanks for watching. Bye-bye.